Welcome to Expats Everywhere, guys. I'm really excited about this interview because we're interviewing in a place that I really, really want to visit, which is Chile. If you could tell us your name, where you're from, and a little about yourself. Sure. My name's Nina. I'm originally from the UK. I'm now living in Santiago uh, with my husband and our three children. And what countries have you worked in? Um, oof, I've worked in loads of places, uh, lived, worked and volunteered in loads of places. So work-wise, Syria before the civil war, Angola, um, also Belgium, France, Germany. I have volunteered in India and in Lebanon as well. And I've uh, lived in Switzerland, um, but I wasn't working at that stage. Uh, here in Santiago, I'm working but on a freelance basis. I'm a blogger and a freelance writer, so um, that's how I get by. Brilliant. And what's it like working in Chile? So my uh, situation is perhaps a bit different to other people. Um, I know here in Chile the work culture, the quite long hours, um, I think it's quite a conservative type of uh, work culture. So from what I hear, if you're a man, um, it can be very long work hours. Sometimes maybe if you're a woman, you'll get a bit more leeway on the understanding that maybe you have to get back for kids. Um, I, I know that's it's not always the case that, you know, the fathers have to be there just as much um, as the mothers. But sometimes there is that conservative kind of culture, um, which I hear about a lot. I think in terms of getting a job in Chile as well, it's quite focused on contacts. It sounds really awful, um, but what I hear, um, it's very much focused on who you know rather than what you know. So perhaps you're going to have more luck getting a job if you meet so-and-so down at a barbecue than, you know, slogging away all day on LinkedIn and uh, sending applications. I'm hearing two things. The first one is try to be a freelancer like yourself because it's a little more flexibility with hours. And the second thing is maybe start building your network instead of relying on job postings. Is that right? Uh, yes and no. Okay. I think um, it's quite tough here in terms of a, if you wanted to do freelance or part-time work. Hmm. The people that I know that work on a part-time basis, they work five days a week, but they'll say finish at three o'clock, which allows them you know, to look after their children or do the other things that they've got going on in their lives. It's very difficult to say work just two days a week, you know, working from home is, is possible in certain jobs, but it's not always the case. Quite a lot of jobs, you, you really need to be there. Quite a lot of jobs, you need to travel. Um, here, I'd say the main industries are mining, construction, wine, tourism. Outside of that, if you're an English speech speaker, uh, maybe teaching. Um, there are some quite prestigious um, schools here, so you might have luck if you are a, you know, a proper teacher, um, if you've got a teaching qualification behind you um, to do well in a teaching profession. Otherwise, teaching English, sort of freelance gig, that kind of thing on the side, um, the salary really isn't that great. Okay. Well, what does a typical day look like for you? Okay. Um, for me, I mean, my situation is different in the terms of I've got three children, so they're my work, basically. <laughs> my first job is I'm a mother. They are pretty exhausting. They're very young, one, four, and six years old. So they take up my day, really. Um, and then in the evenings, I work when I can um, on a freelance basis, um, writing for magazines, uh, newspapers, um, lifestyle. Um, I write basically about uh, being an expat, um, about you know the issues that we face, the challenges, and also the great rewards that we have when we live abroad. Speaking about expats, what does it mean to be an expat to you? Um, so I think it's quite a controversial term. I've had um, quite a few comments when you when I, I started the blog, uh, which is called the expatter. Um, just the word expat for a lot of people has this horrible sort of colonial imperialist type of connotation. Um, for me, it's purely a case of you are living in a place for a short period of time, say three months, six months, a year, and you know it's going to be short term and you're moving on. Whereas, you know, a migrant, you're maybe living there long term, you may be more rooted and you plan to stay there indefinitely. So I really hope one day to be a migrant to really 
settle down somewhere, but it's just not to be for me at the moment. So let's get back into talking about your experience in Chile. So how much can you expect to earn there as an expat? So it varies hugely. Mm. I mean, there are some jobs with really big bucks over here. If you come on a, you know, on a planned expat deal package, you know, maybe you're working for something very high paying already in the, you know, in the US um, and you're moving to Chile, then you can you can make some decent money. However, if you're coming and you're just working on the sort of freelance kind of gig, um, hoping to get by, then it can be really, really tough. And I think a lot tougher than in a country with a low a cost of living. So I, th I think it's a really personal question. I've spoken to friends about this and I reckon just to get by, you really need a million pesos um, a month you know, uh, ideally, if you're in a two person household, you know, and if you've got kids, once they start going to school, um, that's going to add in extra expenses, you know, schooling, um, health care. There is a public health care and a public um, education system, but it's creaking. It's uh, uh, it makes the um, National Health Service in the UK look amazing. Now, it is amazing, but they're, um, you know, here in Chile, uh, for example, you know, you'd have to pay for uh, surgical equipment. You'd have to pay in a lot of cases, you know, for, um, you know, your pillow. I mean, really, really basic stuff. I have had friends that have had nightmare situations in terms of the healthcare. So I think it's really important to check before you move, you know, how much you're earning, um, gross and net, uh, to know how much, you know, you're going to take away and then factor in the really high cost of living here in Chile. Okay, so if we're looking at the low end, you're saying for two people, you need a million pesos. I'd say each. I mean... Okay. Okay, it, it's, it's hugely personal, and I'm sure a lot of people will say, you know, it depends where you're living. If you're living in a in a you know in a downtown smaller apartment, um, you don't have children. It's it's quite different than if you're wanting to live in a sort of leafier suburb. If you're wanting to live in a gated condominium if you want you know to have a bigger apartment if you want to have you know facilities within your apartment um it's really really dependent on your lifestyle i mean it's quite a hard question in terms of you know what do you need to get by um in terms of eating out it's really really expensive i think compared certainly compared to the uk and far more so than uh, spain for example hmm. So just to let you guys know, a million pesos currently is around 1,200 US dollars. And so I'm guessing that's yeah. around 1,000 British pounds, correct? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it fluctuates. Yep. Um, I mean, the peso at the moment has devaluated quite a lot. Mm. So another really important thing uh, to take into consideration before you move is if you're paid in US dollars um, or if you're going to be paid in pesos. Now, it's fine to be paid in Chilean pesos. We are. I'm not for my freelance work for most of it, but you, you really have to be careful because, you know, you've got to take into consideration devaluations. Mm. You know, if you've got any costs back in the US, UK, wherever you come from, you know, you've got to pay taxes there, whatever, then you've really got to be careful. So what kind of lifestyle can you live if you're making only 1 million pesos? I think it's tough, to be honest. I mean, um, again, it depends. If you've got children, I think that's a whole different ball game. you know, healthcare and um, education and things like that. I think one of the mis uh, misconceptions about moving to Chile is that you're going to be, you know, skiing every weekend and exploring the nature and, you know, all the best stuff in Chile is perhaps outside of Santiago. As much as I love Santiago, a lot of the really great things are outside of the city and it can be quite expensive accessing them. Now, of course, there is a great, you know, there's the couch surfing, there's the, there's the backpacking, there's the hitchhiking, you know, that does exist here in Chile. But, you know, I've lived in um, Syria um, before the war, um, in Lebanon, in India, and it was so much cheaper to, or it was so much more accessible to do these kinds of things, you know, accessing raw nature. So if you're living, you know, in a, in a small flat in a very congested part of the city, it might feel that you're missing out on the real reason why you moved to Chile, which for most people is it's all about the nature. What would be the amount? you need to make to reasonably save some money each month? Well, um, I mean, 
I don't want to say uh, that the salary is on here, but you know we're finding already that we're not saving enough. It okay. depends, obviously, how much you're earning, what kind of lifestyle you want to live. Sure. Uh, the reason why we're leaving in Chile is the cost of living. I mean, we love it here. We've got great friends. There are so many um, advantages to the life here. But in terms of saving for a long-term future, I just don't see it. And it's as much with expats as with locals as well. Mm. There is a real fashion tendency or, you know, it's a culture to spend on credit, which personally I find really scary. Mm. I mean, the horror stories of the whole, I don't know, the US subprime, cri subprime crisis and, you know, the credit card thing in the UK, I personally find that quite scary. Maybe I'm a worrier. But for example, if you go to the supermarket and even you buy a pa pack of, uh, you know, chips for, you know, a couple of dollars, you can be asked if you want to pay um, con cuotas or sin cuotas. So like if you want to break it up, like do it in installments or not. There is, you know, when it comes to like the, the Black Fridays, the Cyber Mondays or whatever, you know, people go a bit crazy, um, myself included. I'd like to think that we don't spend beyond our means. And I do see in Chile, I think it scares me, the, you know, how expensive uh, property um, is here, for example, and that people are buying property, you know, with salaries that it really just doesn't make sense. So I'm thinking, you know, either people are buying a lot on credit, or they're getting a lot of help from their parents. Or, you know, there's something that I just don't know about that people are doing to, you know, help them get by this, uh, you know, crazy lifestyle. Well, it sounds exactly like what happened in the U.S. with the subprime crisis. Well, let's move on. And um, how much money do you need to start up there? So if you're moving from the U.S. or the U.K., how much would you recommend people to bring to kind of start up life? Okay, um, again, sorry to say again, but it, it depends. Um, if you're moving with, you know, an expat package and you've already got, you know, some help behind you, if, you know, a company is already going to be paying for your um, temporary accommodation, um, you know, a hotel for the first month, you know, that's totally different. I think make sure that you've got enough, certainly for the first month, ideally for the first three months in terms of accommodation, mm. make sure your health care is covered or that you can afford it. Um, you really, I would personally recommend um, just being totally honest, you know, private health care here in Chile. Um, children, you want to look at the, if you want to look at education, um, certainly if you want a good international school, that's really going to set you back. Um, our children, uh, we're leaving Chile now, but they went to a, um, a local Chile school, but it was still private, but it wasn't by any means as expensive as some of the, you know, super elite international schools. But if you're moving over, you know, with a child, um, you know, 13 years of age who doesn't speak a word of Spanish, then it's going to be really tough to throw them into a completely different education system um, where they don't understand that much English. So I think once, you know, you've got those basic things covered in terms of education, you know, healthcare, you know, the basic groceries, you know, you've got enough to survive on for the first three months, then that's going to help you. If you've already got a job, you're moving here with a job, um, you know, you'll probably slot in a lot quicker. But if you're having to do the job hunt alongside, it's going to be really stressful if you're trying to, you know, save money on terms of, you know, accommodation and, you know, you can't eat out and uh, you can't get out and enjoy, you know, the, the really great landscapes, nature that Chile, um, you know, has got. How should someone pack to move there and what's the weather like? Okay, uh, in Chile, it's pretty great in terms of, you know, whatever you need, it's, it's, you can find it here. Okay, maybe you need to pay well above the odds, but I don't know if it's your mac and cheese from the US, if it's your, I don't know, tea bags from the UK, you can pretty much, you know, find all that stuff here. So you don't need to worry too much about that. Um, I think medications, like moving anywhere, you need to make sure you've got your personal medications. Um, my uh, son has a very severe um, allergies. Um, he needs an EpiPen. And at one stage, they didn't have any EpiPens in the country. I know that's a thing in a lot of countries. So I'm not dissing Chile, um, particularly in terms of um, healthcare on that front. But that's certainly something to take uh, into consideration. 
if you're coming just for a holiday, you know, it depends where you're traveling in Chile, but it can get really cold, um, both in the north, you know, desert type um, areas, and then south if you're moving, you know, to closer, like more Antarctic um, style uh, climate. So check where you're going and, um, you know, pack your clothing accordingly. Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, let's change gears here. How safe is it there? And do you feel safe on a personal level? Um, I feel hugely safe here. Um, at the moment, you know, as we're speaking, we're in the uh, coronavirus pandemic, so we haven't been leaving our apartment. Um, but we do live in an apartment, and I was very keen to choose an apartment when we first moved here just for the safety reasons. I'd heard horror stories about, you know, break-ins uh, in houses, and I know that you are much safer in an apartment. It's not just the... It's the safety in numbers. I think you're a lot more vulnerable if you're in a house that's not to say that you're uh, really at risk if you're living in a house but um, certainly if you're living in a tower block apartment um, you do feel a lot safer there again I don't know if it's rumor um, if it's just my perception but I do think things have got worse here in Chile I think it's been there's been more office break-ins because um, people are not working at the moment or having to work from home there's quite a nasty street crime. It's not so bad in, you know, the area where I live. Um, it's a lovely area called Las Condes. Um, but even in a very, very affluent area, like um, an area called Vitacura, there have been quite a lot of, um, yeah, muggings, um, just, you know, handbag snatching, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, it's often accompanied with a, a knife or a gun. I've never had any incidents, nothing's happened to any, you know, close friends of mine. I do have one friend who, on Christmas Eve, everything was robbed, uh, she was in a house, um, but I don't have any friends that have been robbed or had any sort of violent experience. So, yeah, it's, it's Latin America, it doesn't have a great hmm. reputation, but um, I think in terms of a comparison to lots of other Latin American cities, it feels you know, so much safer. Okay. Well, let's lighten things up and let's talk about how you meet people and what can you do for fun? Sure. Um, yeah, it, there's a great, I think, social scene here. I found it so easy to meet people, you know, through, um, you know, my kid's school, my kid's nursery. Um, but even if you don't have children, there is a really strong expat community. And in terms of meeting locals as well, it's very intertwined. It's not like you're just in an expat bubble or you're just in this, you know, very chilly cultural scene. Mm. I have a lot of friends uh, that are here on a long-term basis or have moved here for good. Um, they have husbands or partners um, who are from Chile. So it's nice that you feel a bit more rooted to the country than, for example, when I lived in Brussels and there are a lot of people coming and going and there was a really high rotation of people. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, I think that that's a very common problem that people have in expat communities it's just a revolving door, isn't it? So it's nice to have yeah, I, locals that kind of can settle you in and root you in. That's awesome. Yeah, totally. I think it's one of the best things about living in Chile, to be honest. What's the visa process like? Can you give us any indication of what you went through or what your husband went through? Um, sure. So we moved here. I was a dependent on um, his visa. It's it's quite straightforward. There are very, very long queues. Basically, you need to know what you're doing and just follow the steps. Um, mm. There was a it's something you need is called the um, your root, which is basically your ID card, and you need it to you know to do banking, to you know get a, a phone here, basically to breathe in Chile. You need your root. Um, so to go through this whole uh, visa process, we did have a company to help us, which was amazing and really helped. Um, but I think the thing that helped me most was I was pregnant at the time and we have two other small children. Um, in Chile, children are kings. So, and if you're pregnant, you know, you are our queen. Um, you will literally skip the line. So, for example, 
for our visas. Um, we arrived and we were really lucky. We got there very early in the morning and I'd say we were in and out the whole process in an hour. Again, getting my third child who was born in Chile, getting her uh, Chile passport and her ID. I was in and out in 15 minutes. It's been the absolute record. It was incredible. However, if you don't have help, if you're completely new to the country, you don't speak Spanish um, and you're just doing it bit by bit, then, yeah, just be patient. Be really, really patient <laughs> and be polite. <laughs> All right. So the, the pro tips, bring kids and be patient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get pregnant. No, 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 no. <laughs> Let's go back. And um, you, you've mentioned healthcare a couple of times, actually. So how is the healthcare, and would you feel comfortable getting a procedure done there? Um, I would, absolutely, 100%. I'd feel probably more comfortable getting a procedure done in Chile than I would in the UK, depending on what it was I was having done. We have private insurance. So how it works here in Chile is that you normally get a sort of a private insurance provider, which is called your, your ISAPRE, and then you uh, you shop for a different ISAPRE, a different you know health insurance provider. Um, depending on what you need doing, you need to shop at the different clinics, you need to look at it's quite complicated. Look at, you know, which, you know, clinic um, does that doctor work here? Does he work there? And maybe you have to top it up. Maybe you don't. It really depends. We are with um, Bupa Health Insurance and, you know, that covers pretty much everything. So we were very lucky in that regard. But it was something for me that was a deal breaker. I've got three young children, the second child who has um, severe allergies, I was pregnant. For me, you know, really good healthcare uh, insurance was the deal breaker before we moved here. So salary and health insurance were my absolute no-goes. The other stuff, you know, I was quite chilled out about. But um, for me, good healthcare was, yeah, something that was really important to me. Right on. Do you think that Chile is a good travel hub? Why or why not? Yes and no. I mean, it's obviously, you know, the place that you'll need to come to if you want to explore the rest of Chile. And in Chile, maybe I'm biased. I love it. But you've got a bit of everything. You've got, you know, the deserts in the north. You've got the, you know, kind of like iceberg landscapes in the south. Having said that, a lot of Chile I haven't explored. It's a really big country um, and you need time and ideally money um, to explore. So... <laughs> Yes and no. I mean, I haven't explored the rest of Latin America, so I can't really compare. I'm just going on my experiences in, you know, in other places I've lived. I think, um, you know, Santiago is still a great city. A lot of people just, you know, get in and then get out as quickly as possible. Everything works. It's very efficient. I think it's quite an easy city. Okay. Tell us, what are some quick pros and cons of living there? Pros, um, as a sun-deprived Brit, I'd have to say the sunshine. People here, I'm all the locals will complain about the weather, but honestly, I think it's fantastic. So we're out um, every day. Okay, the winter can be quite tough, um, but the sunshine here is just, it's just lovely. I found it really easy to make friends, and that's something which really affects, I think, your whole experience um, when you move abroad. If you make great friends, then you can handle most stuff. And, you know, if you've got private health insurance, if you can afford a decent education, um, then there are really, really good options here. In terms of the cons, I'd have to say, you know, top of the list, cost of living. You really need to all earn good butts to make it worth a while. Um, I know a lot of people that get excited to move here. And then, you know, like us, you do the maths a bit down the line. Or, you know, for us, when the peso was devaluated, it just doesn't make sense to be here anymore, to be so far away from friends and family. As much as we love it here for a holiday, for us personally, it just doesn't make sense for us to be here on a long-term basis. Okay, well, this has been an awesome interview. And if people want to get to know more about you, for example, your blog, can you tell us a bit about that and how they can get a hold of you? Um, sure, I don't know. I mean, maybe you can post it in the notes as well. So we my absolutely blog will, called... yeah. Thank you. So my blog is called The um, the Expatter. Um, it's basically a blog for mostly with expat women in mind, but I had a lot of um, guys that uh, reach out to just for questions, particularly on Chile. 
you know, I'm quite active on social media. So on Instagram, on Twitter um, and on Facebook, you know, and if you've got any questions about moving to Chile, then, you know, a lot of people will just, you know, drop me a line on Instagram, Facebook or a, a message through my blog. Yeah. So if you have any questions at all, please just reach out. Perfect. Well, it's a beautifully designed blog. It really grabbed our attention when we came across it. And it's our absolute honor to have you on and interview you. So we oh, really appreciate it, Nina. Oh, no, I'm, I'm thrilled. It was, uh, it was an honor to be featured. Um, absolute pleasure. Lovely speaking to you. Great speaking to you.